why the Seventh-day Adventist Church had been raised up in comparison to other churches and, and that we're still part of this great reformation that is taking place because we, after all, we're the only ones that are still protesting, aren't we? And um, he said, it is amazing. He says, I've never been able to speak to someone like you that hasn't jumped up and, uh, and threatened and got angry. And he said, oh, I said, well, I'm a little bit different than the, the, the rest of them. But isn't it wonderful the way God leads us um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, week-by-week -week basis? And, um, you know, he's, he's just so good to us. And even to the extent that we couldn't come bowling last, uh, last Saturday evening because... Um, we were out visiting, and um, I had this inclination, you know, um, I should go and visit my lady. I call my Dutch mum, and why do I call her my Dutch mum? It's because when my parents split up, I used to spend a lot of time with my best mate from school, and this is his mum, of course, but he's in Australia, and she's now 86 years of age. And uh, we visited her, and um, the evening started to go on, and I think, oh, well, we've, we've missed um, soup and buns, um, yeah, and it just seemed like the Lord said, look, don't hurry, don't go away, just, just hang in there. And uh, she said to Mary Ann, she said, look, could you just take my soup out of the, out of the, uh, out of the fridge? You know, I like to eat on time, I'm a diabetic. Um, and uh, Mary Ann did that, and she said, oh, I'm not feeling too well. Could you just give me, get me a drink, uh, Mary Ann, also out of the fridge? And so I got, I'm in control of the soup. And then Mary Ann goes, hey, 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 forget the soup, come over here. All of a sudden, she collapsed on us uh, with a major um, turn stroke and I thought this is amazing so I, I grabbed hold of her and I laid her down on the floor and, and, and she was gone she was gone and I thought oh no this is my mum and you know it's been so good to me and I just instinctively gave her a whack on the back and I said to her later it's the only time I've spanked you by the way uh, and suddenly she coughed and began to vomit and I thought thank you Lord thank you Lord but isn't God good because his spirit told us to go there the doctor said to us afterwards, if you weren't, if those young, if that couple, they even said that young couple weren't there, uh, you wouldn't be here today. So we give God a lot of thanks and praise on a week to week basis that he leads us and he says he will lead us every day. Let us just pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, we'd like to say thank you that we can be in your house on this weekend, that we can be here on the Sabbath day. And we give you thanks and praise for leading us through this past week, Lord, and that you've blessed us and that your spirit has abided with us in every aspect uh, of, our, of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which is also holy because it was given to us by your Holy Spirit. And we just pray, Father, that your spirit will talk to us this morning through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And today we're going to be talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But what a great, great Sabbath and weekend to truly remember the sacrifice of Christ, our Lord, with communion, with open communion. As the world remembers the death and resurrection of Christ this weekend through the pagan festival of Easter, we again honour his sacrifice on the Sabbath as we do every Sabbath, but this one is even more special as we celebrate it with communion. The enactment that Jesus himself gave so truly and sincerely to us to remember the one and only sacrifice that could free the human race from eternal destruction. You know, just before, a week before, um, Jesus um, started to, to prepare for his crucifixion, he had a triumph entry into Jerusalem where they were singing Hosanna, praise to Hosanna, and their palms were being laid down, and he came in on a donkey uh, as a king. And that's what, how the kings entered the city of Jerusalem in times gone on a donkey. And here, uh, here it is a week later, and they're celebrating the feast of the Passover. And I just want to put us in the picture. Here in, in Jerusalem, they're celebrating the feast of unleavened bread and the Passover. And, you know, the Passover moon is hanging deep in the sky. All these people are there with the tents from every imaginable part of the world that bordered Israel. You got the scene now? Can you imagine what's happening here? It's not a quiet event. There's a lot of activity outside. And uh, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to go and prepare a place for us where we can celebrate um, the Passover. So they did. As, as we know, they went and um, 
met this man um, who had a pitcher of water on his head and uh, told him we wanted to use the room so that we can celebrate the Passover with our Lord and Master. But I want to pick up our story this morning in the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and reading from verse 36. We're jumping a bit of a head uh, today because we know that the, 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 um, the supper has taken place. And uh, reading from verse uh, 36 of Matthew 26. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter, two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto his disciples and find them asleep and says unto him, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at, the ha he is at hand that doth betray me. This is an amazing depiction. Can I just have that picture up on the, on the screen, please? Yeah. This is an amazing um, depiction of the start of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And you know, for me, this is where the crucifixion week starts. Here I found this picture done by the famous Adventist um, artist, Harry Anderson. And I know you can't see it that well, but when I saw this, tears came to my eyes. Because here, lying on this cold, dark ground in Gethsemane, remember, where did sin start? Sin started in the garden, and Jesus dealt with it in the garden. Here we have our Saviour, lying on this cold ground and he has left three men at the gate to pray for him. Three men. His most favourite disciples, Peter, James and John, who just not that long ago were, were on him on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw the glory of God shine through and where he said, this is my son. And here he is now, the son of God, lying on this cold ground, carrying the sins of the world. Remember, remember, at this point in time, it was all talked about. From what we've been studying in the, in the, in the Sabbath school, in the Book of Origins, we've been studying how this plan was sorted out, how God created the world, how sin came into the world, and it was all pointing to this day. 4,000 years of preparation being talked about. Three and a half years Jesus walked upon the earth showing us the love of God the Father. He healed people. He, uh, he talked with people. He loved people. And he gave us that wonderful, wonderful example of how to live. 4,000 years of planning had all gone by. The prophets had depicted and told us over... Uh, throughout the years that one day this will happen and here we have Jesus our Savior our Lord God of the universe God who created us who created us in a wonderful garden here as a, as a man incarnate um, lying in this garden that he created and of course sin has brought him um, thus far let's just go back and, and look at our our story that we've just read. 
So Jesus has came to the garden with his disciples and he says, sit here and pray. Sit here and pray. Why did he want them to sit there and pray? He wanted them to pray for him so that he wouldn't feel alone. How often has Jesus prayed for his disciples, for Zebedee, uh, for for Peter, John and James. Many, many times. How many times has he supported them, strengthened them and comforted them? And all he's asking is for them to spend time in prayer while he's in the garden suffering. He only went a little while, uh, a little way, the Bible tells us. He went a stone throw and um, he lay there in sorrowful. Even when he walked to the garden after celebrating the Last Supper with them, they noticed that there was something different about him. And, you know, we are too the same, aren't we, when we have an exam on or something special that uh, we have to prepare for. Uh, we kind of go quiet because we're contemplating or thinking about uh, what, what is before us. Jesus knew what was before him. In the next hours, in the next days to come, he knew what was before him. So we can understand why he was so sorrowful because it is sin that separates us from God and he's about to take upon himself the sin of the world which would separate him from God the Father. His biggest doubt, maybe, was is it going to be forever? So Jesus is very, very sorrowful. And as he's laying on the ground and he goes a little, faith, a little further in sorry, verse 39 and he fell on his face and prayed. Here we have Jesus walking into the garden, making slow steps, and he falls prostrate on the ground, praying to his father, beseeching his father. And what does he say to his father? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Another, an amazing statement from Jesus. Can you, can you imagine him? He's lying there with his cup in his hand, saying, Lord, if it is possible, please take this away from me. But Lord, not what I want to be done, but what you want me to do. This cup of indignation, this cup of, uh, of wrath that he's holding in, in his hand. He says, Lord, do I really have to do it? But he said, no, I will do it because it's your will that I do this for the human race. 4,000 years have gone past and we're looking to this particular moment. 4,000 years. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh to the disciples and found them asleep. You know, Sister White says, when he came to his disciples to wake them and, he, and they looked upon him, they didn't recognize him anymore. His form had changed because of this anguish and stress that he was going through. You know, his blood, his face was covered with blood as these big, huge droplets hit the ground. His clothes would have been stained by these blood. But let's just go back a little bit too and think, here we have the true Lamb of God. The true Lamb of God, um, only in a matter of hours, going to be sacrificed for each and every one of us. And as we know from the sanctuary service that when a lamb was, uh, was sacrificed in the, in the sanctuary... What, what happened? The sinner actually came and put his hand upon the lamb and, and confessed his sins and, uh, and uh, cut the lamb's throat. So here we have Jesus now being coming, the lamb, the true lamb of God, where all the sins of the world are placed upon him, upon his human form. He didn't use any part of his divinity to carry this through even though I'm pretty sure the devil must have tempted him with it. But here he is, carrying all the sins of the world, the sins that we've committed uh, over and over again, the sins that the world has committed. But when I just reflect on my own sins, it brings tears to my eyes. Because who should be there? Not Jesus, but Gary. Should be lying there. Um, but he did it because he loves me so much. And this... This whole story of the Garden of Gethsemane is the epitome of love. This is where the, uh, the crucifixion week actually starts. He actually starts there. And all he, he wanted was that his disciples 
would pray for him. But then again, he realized they fell asleep because Jesus had to go through this by himself, all alone. That's why it was cold in the Garden of Eden because of the separation from his father. We know that in Israel, in this desert environment, that at night it gets very cold. But his wasn't a cold of, of, of warmth from his body. It was this cold of being separated from the love of his father. How sad is that? This is Jesus, the, lamb, or the true lamb of God, laying on the ground in the garden. Watch and pray. You know, how often has it been said to us, because of the life that we're living, because of the environment that we live in, because of the world we live in, this is what we are to do also. Watch and pray. Because the devil is going around like a, a hungry lion, devouring everything he can. And prayer, prayer should be the number one thing uh, in our lives. You know, the first time that Marianne and I wake up, it's good morning uh, to each other, and we thank the Lord that we're both there together in the bed and uh, we want to start our day with him. Prayer is so important. And the last thing at night, good night, Lord. You know, remember the old TV um, channels we used to have when the old Kiwi used to say, you know, good night, Kiwi, or good night, New Zealand, and he'd switch off the light. That's what we do for the Lord. Good night, Lord. Thank you for the day. Prayer, watch and pray. He went again away the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. He submitted himself 100% to the will of God. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then came he to the disciples and said to them, Sleep on now, it's okay. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Absolutely amazing. But I want you now just to kind of flip over here to the book of Luke, to the next, um, the next gospel, Luke um, chapter 22, verse 43. Luke chapter 22, verse 43. And it's the same, uh, the same uh, description of what's taking place here in the garden. But it's uh, the version from Luke. And uh, he says here in, in, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse uh, 43, And there ap appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. So you could imagine what was taking place in heaven, can't you? All the alarm bells had come up on the, com on the command screen because they see what Jesus was going through. Here he's suffering um, he's, he's exhausted and he's just about dying in the garden. And then all of a sudden, angel, maybe Gabriel, is dispatched from heaven, go and strengthen my son. He needs, a, he needs our help now. So he gets this help from the, from the angel because, again, the spirit of prophecy said if that angel was not sent, he would have died in the garden. He's taken on a human form. None of us could have possibly gone through this if we hadn't prepared for it over those three and a half years. Three and a half years he communed with his father to get the strength for this day, to know the will of God for, for him and for every one of us. Jesus really was scared that he would not um, survive this and that he would be totally um, separated from his father. You know, when, uh, when, he, when we ourselves are in conflict, we call upon the name of Jesus and he came. He had no one to call upon except the strength of his Father and, and the Holy Spirit. We all have a, um, an intercessor. No one was intercessing for Jesus because he is our intercessor and he's paying a huge price for each and every one of us. Let's just leave the garden now. We know that um, the story goes on to say that Judas came with the soldiers and the Pharisees. And, it's, as, and as we know, um, Jesus told, I mean, sorry, Judas told him that you will recognize him when I give him a kiss. 
And you're thinking, well, why would he have done that? They knew Jesus. They used to see him in the temple. They used to see him in the streets preaching and healing people. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. So let's, uh, let's just go to the book of John this time and uh, turn into the book of John, uh, verse 18. Uh, sorry, chapter 18 and reading from verse 17. John 18, the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 17. Oh, sorry, I've um, gone a bit of ahead of myself here. Um, no, sorry, come, come back a bit. It's the um, same chapter down in um, verse 5. We'll read from verse 5. Then answered him Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betray him, stood with them. So here we have the, the, uh, the soldiers coming um, to arrest Jesus. Judas is with him. Judas gives him a kiss. And now why do you think that Judas gave him a kiss? As I said, they would have known him um, from seeing him every day in the, in the marketplace, in the streets, in the temple. G Judas had to kiss Jesus because he had changed so much because of Gethsemane. They didn't recognize him. Isn't that amazing? He was not the same Jesus that walked with his disciples. Anyway, our verse goes on to say, and as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went back and fell to the ground. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, I am he. He said, let these others go. I am here. But as soon as he said, I am, divinity flashed through him and they all fell on the ground. He, when he said, I am, his divinity shone through. He showed them that he was God and because of the brightness of the divinity that came through him, they all fell on the ground. Isn't that amazing? Here we have God's son, God himself, paying a huge price for us here in Gethsemane. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, in verse 8, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that, they same might be that the same might be fulfilled which he spoke of them, which thou gavest me, I have lost none. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. You know, when you read this, and you've read it many times over the years of being, uh, being Christians, and of course, here we have old spontaneous Peter, eh? He pulls out his sword and go whack and cuts off his ear. And you think he most probably was aiming for his head, but he cut off his ear. And when you read that, it's most probably, you know, you could think, uh, what's he trying, why did he cut off his ear? It's as if Peter's saying, didn't you hear what he said? He said, I am. He is God. He is Jesus, right? And Jesus said, no, we don't want any of that. And he picked it up, his, up the ear and healed him. Even that would have blown you away, wouldn't it? Here it is. He picks up this guy's ear, Melchior's ears, and heals him, just showing who he really, really was. Amazing. I am, he said. Then we go over to the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke again. We'll go back, I should say. Um, reading from verse, uh, chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 39. Twenty-two, verse thirty-nine. Okay, here we have again the discourse of the garden. Um, but the one that I'm after was since it's, it's, oh yes, and verse um, fifty-three, and he said, "When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power." Of darkness you know Satan had been waiting a long time for this moment whereby he could try and take Jesus out they took th then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest house and Peter followed afar off you know when you just think of this the statement 
um, it also has a, has, a, has a sermon in it, I suppose. They took, then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. On, on the way down from the Last Supper to the, to the garden, Jesus had the discourse with Peter and said to him, you know, um, tonight you're going to be offended uh, because of me. And Peter says, oh, no, he says, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be offended. He says, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll even die for you. I'm just paraphrasing now. He said, um, no, Peter, you will deny me three times. And here we have now Peter. Um, Jesus has been arrested. He's uh, gone up before the, before um, Pilate and, and uh, he's up in the upper room. And uh, here we have Peter following afar off. And, you know, when you think uh, Peter here, he's, he's following at a distance. And of course, when he was asked of the girl, this little girl, you're one of the, you're one of the followers of the disciples of Jesus, he goes, no, 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 I'm not. And you know, we can also fall into the same trap as Peter did. If we do not follow Jesus close up and instead always follow him at a distance, we've got no power to overcome temptation. Peter followed afar off. He followed at a distance and he didn't have the strength to stand up for Jesus. And we know that from, our, from Scripture that as soon as he denied him three times, the cock crowed, Peter looked around, and he saw Jesus in that upper chamber, and he cried. He took off. He took off. He was so hurt. His heart was breaking because the words that Jesus said came true. Just within a matter of hours um, after uh, he had prophesied it, and of course, where did Peter run? He just took off. He ran and he ran through the night and he ended up here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he also fell on his face begging for forgiveness because of this great sin that he'd committed in denying his Lord. Brothers and sisters, never ever get into that same situation whereby we deny our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And I know we've done it, but we're, we're starting a new day today, a new walk with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Don't follow at a distance. Follow as close as you can and build that relationship with our Lord. Wonderful story, but it is so sad to see our Saviour um, in the garden of, uh, of Gethsemane. I'd just like to go to my, to my next slide here. And of course, here we have um, the depiction of the crucifixion and, um, he, you know, Brother Anderson is, is depicted in a, in a very pretty calm way because um, Jesus looks pretty um, clean hanging up there on the cross but the, and there's all these people mingling around. But when you think of what's actually taken place here, I was always interested in the fact that there's three. And in the Bible we notice that when there's a reference to God or something really particular, it happens in the, in, in the vein of the number three. And of course, um, here we have Jesus right in the middle. And uh, on him, two thieves, two malefactors, and um, the people are, are yelling and screaming at Jesus, you know, you saved, your, saved others, um, come down and save yourself. And of course, what, what, are, what is the Bible, or what has been illustrated here by these two thieves hanging, hanging on the cross? What has been illustrated? It's been illustrated here simply the fact that we have one choice. One choice. Either you are for God or you are against him. And we know from the story, from the crucifixion, that one of these thieves chose Jesus. Is that our decision today? Are you going to be like one of these thieves and accept Jesus? Or are you going to be like the other one and, and scoff him? Like, like, like he did, no, please. My prayer is that you be like the thief that accepted Jesus. Because what did Jesus say to him? I say to you today that you will be with me in paradise. And we have that wonderful assurance today, don't we? That we will be with him in paradise. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand fully what Jesus went through in Gethsemane. If we don't understand Gethsemane, then we have to go back on our knees and under, start to pray that we can understand the plan of salvation. Today, we're coming together.
to celebrate the Lord's communion. As he, as he spent it with his disciples prior to all this happening in uh, Jerusalem that evening, um, he, um, he said, uh, whatever you do uh, in regards to the, um, the Last Supper, do in remembrance of me. So now I'd like just to uh, have a prayer uh, before we go into the foot washing. And uh, if you could be all upstanding, please. The ladies have.